Sorry I can't be with you today folks, but COVID has got me once again. I think that's the fourth time now. So it's safer for me to be at home and I've recorded this uh, sermon for you uh, today. I hope to be back uh, in action very, very soon because my line is now getting ever more faint and I'm just waiting for that negative test. But anyway, here we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we explore the transfiguration together this morning, may you open our eyes and our ears to hear afresh from you and this very well-known passage. In the name of Jesus. Amen. When was the last time that you were truly amazed by something? Something that completely changed how you viewed things in life. I know over the past few year, couple of years even, I've used my children as sermon illustrations a lot, but I'm constantly amazed at how they are growing and learning new things. As a father, seeing my children develop new skills, it just makes my heart grow more and more for my children. I've used these experiences to think through how it must be for our Heavenly Father to see us as we grow and as things start to make sense. I remember sharing with you a few months back a tweet that said something along the lines of when a new scientific discovery is made, God sits back and says, now you know how I do that. What about the last time God amazed you? Have you seen a miracle recently? Has something happened in your life that's made you realise God has been involved? Perhaps it's been a difficult week, but you've had a sense of peace through it all. Perhaps you've been unwell, like I have, but God has been by your side helping and guiding you through. Perhaps you've had a really good week and you've sensed God urging you on. Well, traditionally, when we read about the transfiguration, the usual line for a preacher is to go down the line of mountaintop experiences and valley struggles. I'm not going to do that today, though. However, the transfiguration is one of those very well-known stories in the Gospels. It's easy to overlook it as, well, yeah, we know that story well. It comes here in the Gospels. We know what happens. So why do we need to hear it again? Well, we do know it well. But that doesn't mean there's nothing left for us to learn from hearing it and exploring it once again. In the same way that we know the Christmas and Easter story really well, we always learn something new each time we hear them. And I believe that the Lord is wanting to speak to us through the Transfiguration today. So I'm going to take a different approach this morning than the usual mountain tops and valley lows because I want us to consider the transfiguration as one of those times when God shows up in an extraordinary way and reveals more of himself to Peter, James and John. Essentially here we are taking those moments of amazement that I talked about at the start and cranking them up a few notches on the scale. If we dig back into the Old Testament, we read about various events like this, when the veil of ordinariness is drawn back and the fuller reality is disclosed. All those times when people encounter God and God is nearby, also known as a theophany. Now I imagine not many, if indeed any of us, have ever experienced anything quite like the transfiguration. Most of us don't in our lives. The early Christians didn't either. They didn't see these wonderful, fantastic events. Yes, of course, they saw miracles. We see miracles. They saw signs and wonders. We see signs and wonders. But we don't see anything quite like the transfiguration. It could be easy, therefore, to discount that it happened and perhaps say it was a hallucination of Peter, James and John. But it's in the Bible. Therefore, it carries significance for our faith. 
When something like this happens, it is hugely important and life-changing. Often, when God speaks to us, it's because we need to take note of what he's saying. More often than not, he's been trying to get our attention in so many other ways. And then he finally goes, look, will you just take note of what I'm saying to you, please? The Transfiguration normally appears in the lectionary the week before Lent begins. And I think it's significant for the church as we start to look towards the journey to the cross, which begins on Wednesday and takes us through the next six weeks. Indeed, in Mark's Gospel, where we had the reading from today, it comes in the second half. And Mark's Gospel is a gospel of two halves. The first eight chapters telling us of Jesus' ministry over three years, with the mark and sense of urgency where he keeps repeating, and immediately, and immediately Jesus did, and immediately Jesus did. But then we get to chapter 9 where our reading is today, and things slow down, and we start that journey towards Holy Week and the cross. Peter, James and John were going to walk that journey with Jesus, not knowing about the death and the resurrection that we know about when we read this story. So on the mountaintop, Peter, James and John see something incredible that will help them through all that is to come. So perhaps for us, as we turn our minds more towards the cross, as I say, we have the benefit of hindsight, knowing that even though it all ends in death, there is the joy of the Easter celebration to come. And I think in some ways, we often miss the fact that the disciples did not know what was going to happen. If we try to think how Peter, James and John must have felt at this moment, I'm not surprised that Mark says they were so frightened. I think I would have been too in that situation. Once again, we have the wonderful Peter blurting out what comes to mind. He's suggesting they build shelters to prolong the moment. And I get that, because when God shows up, I always want those moments to continue myself. But God knows how much we need, what we need, and when we need it. And it's the same here in this encounter with God. He knows how much Peter, James, and John could handle. So what can we learn from the transfiguration, though? With humility, I want to think about this event not just from a human point of view, but from God's point of view. So far, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has, metaphorically speaking, led the disciples up a high mountain with a new view of God's kingdom. There have been extraordinary actions and puzzling but profound words as Jesus has explained what God is up to. The disciples are having their eyes open to the truth and what God's kingdom will truly look like. But those who don't see continue to look. Now, despite the Jewish understanding of what God's kingdom might look like, here we are seeing that it is something completely different. We see that Jesus is the Messiah. It's concentrating on Jesus himself and how the kingdom is arriving with him. So far in the gospel, if the disciples had been led, metaphorically speaking, up a mountain to see the kingdom, here, Jesus is leading three of them literally up the mountain. And we see the disciples' eyes, or at least the three that were there, open to a new reality. In many ways, friends, our Western culture has lost some of the fact that the world is not simply as we see it, but that there is so much more going on than meets the eye. If we think of scientists looking at things in a microscope, seeing the minute cells and atoms and how they all fit together, through to perhaps the astronauts who see the world from a totally different perspective, there are many layers. You've got the macro and the micro. I wonder, do you remember in your science lessons when you first looked into a microscope and how nothing looked the same afterwards? 
I imagine that's sort of how Peter, James and John must have felt after the transfiguration had taken place. They'd seen something new and they could never go back to the old. What about the significance of Elijah and Moses appearing? Well, Jesus is continuing and completing the tasks of them both. Both of these prophets disappeared from view rather than dying in the ordinary way with their friends and family around them. Here, they reappear and the veil of ordinariness is drawn back again for a moment. As I said earlier, the theophany takes place in this moment. Now, this isn't a revelation of Jesus' divinity, as if it was, it would make Elijah and Moses divine too. And that's not what Mark is trying to get at. But what it is, is it's likely a sign of Jesus being entirely caught up with, bathed in the love, power and kingdom of God. In many ways, this is showing us that Jesus isn't just fantasizing about God's kingdom, but he is speaking and doing the truth. It gives us a clear sign that he is indeed the true prophet and Messiah. This is further confirmed with the affirmation that Jesus is God's son whom he loves. It links us back to Moses and Elijah who are vital in preparing the way and now Jesus is here to finish the job. With the transfiguration we discover once again that the way had been prepared for Jesus by the prophets of old. It confirms the prophecies of the Old Testament and it gives us yet another example of when God promises something, it will happen. For Peter, James and John, it must have been overwhelming to witness such an event. When was the last time you were overwhelmed by God? When was the last time you were amazed by his power and it made you look at everything with a different perspective. Perhaps, friends, that's the message that we have to take away today. With everything going on around us in the world, it's easy to lose sight of God and what his plan is. Yet, in these few verses where we witness Jesus, Moses and Elijah, we're reminded that God has a plan and we can be confident in that. Sometimes we need to shift our own perspective from our thoughts and surrender afresh to the Lord and go with what he is saying to us. It might sound strange or different to what we expect, but when Peter, James and John were walking up the mountain with Jesus, I very much doubt that they would have been expecting to see what they did. Our perspective on things changes how we view the world. What if we're being asked to look at the world through the eyes of God rather than our own? Maybe then it would start to make more sense. We know what is to come when we read Revelation. And in some ways, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised at what is going on in the here and the now. But we're not to know the full picture. God is a God who will surprise us along the way. He will give us what we need when we need it, including a reminder of who he is. I wonder then where that leaves us today. Where do you need to be surprised by God? What is it that you are struggling with at the moment? Where do you need a perspective shift? Again, this is a different way of thinking to the world. In our society where everything is about me, 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 when we look at things with a different perspective, with God's perspective, we see things about you, you, you. We stop being selfish and we start serving one another. No matter how we are feeling, no matter what has happened, as the old hymn says, God is working his purpose out. It might not always be clear. It might not always make sense. It probably won't be expected, but we can be assured 
that we are part of God's plan for the world in the here and the now. We can be sure that we are the church for this time and that it is, it is for us to bring some perspective to all that's going on around us. The voice from the cloud says, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. There's a command in there from God. We are to listen to his son. Perhaps that's where we've got things wrong. We've too often tried to go our own way, thinking we know best and leaving God as an afterthought in our lives. As I've said, we often don't experience something as dramatic as the transfiguration. But each of us who form the church are called to do just what the heavenly voice is saying. Listen to Jesus, because he is God's beloved son. As we learn to listen, we may get scared. We may say the wrong things, but we will find that the glory of the Lord creeps upon us unawares, strengthening us as it did for the disciples, for the road ahead and whatever is still to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this encounter that Peter, James and John experienced. Father, we pray that you would overwhelm and surprise and amaze us in the here and the now. Father, you know what we need when we need it. And we ask you to show us more of your plan and how we fit. We ask you to strengthen us with power from on high. We ask you to forgive us when we've not listened to Jesus. And today we surrender afresh to him and say, here we are. We are listening to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.